Kyle Beeman. I am a freshman at Hofstra studying music business. What I am about to perform is an original piece that I have composed, produced, and engineered inspired by Thelonious Monk. I present to you Swing Towards Justice. His music is so inspiring because whenever Thelonious played, it was creative, wild, and different. And he played the keyboards like it was like drums, like. <laughs> and I like that about him. Thelonious Monk's music is incredibly unique and diverse, and the way he plays it is very influential. He always spoke his truth, and didn't compromise his ideas for other people. Thelonious kept doing what he loved, even when he was just doing it for himself. Music is a universal language, and can speak to a person in many more ways than just for a Hi, my name is Zena Grace Baker, and I am a monk descendant. The piece that I selected is April in Paris, because someday I plan to visit Paris. The song started off peaceful and sweet. At the end, the music sounded confident. It made me feel calm. I drew a picture of April in Paris. Hi, my name is Aya. And I am nine years old in third grade. Midville, Georgia is my home. When I listen to jazz, it makes me want to go in my room and come out all the jazz stuff. Hi, my name is Joey Scopani. I'm 11 years old. And Felonious Monk's um, music is for everyone. This is Ruby, my dear. My name is Kiana Flores and I'm a senior at Cooperative Arts and Humanities High School. What I found really interesting in Thelonious Monk's Blue Monk is the way that each part has its own individual flair, but those parts come together very nicely and cohesively to create this really deep, rich sound. And I also believe it's really interesting the way Thelonious Monk actually plays the piano and the way his fingers are positioned. At first I thought it looked a little unconventional, but after listening to a few recordings and watching him play, it really becomes 
a staple in who he is as a player and it looks very natural. So I really enjoyed overall looking at Thelonious Monk and analyzing how he created these amazing pieces of music and so far my favorite is definitely Blue Monk. Hi, I'm Kylie. And I'm Chloe. And we're both descendants of the, the Monk, Monk family. family. So we listen to the song Straight No Chaser by Thelonious Monk and um, do you want to say how it made you feel first? Um, sure. So, um, how this song made me feel was smooth, old school, ready to dance, proud, and amazed. So, what I kind of felt like was I felt classy, but also um, amazed, and I kind of felt happy too. But I also felt like I've heard like these songs in all grown up, like, um, Good evening, and welcome to Monk 103, the man, his music, and bridging the racial divide. My name is Marcella Monk Flake, and I'm the executive director of Monk Youth Jazz and Steam Collective. And I'm just so excited that you guys would join us this afternoon, we, this evening. We've been working really, really hard on this event. Um, you know, we really wanted to bring something special to the community, and we're just so glad that you have joined us. Um, just a few housekeeping uh, details first. I'd like to thank all the young people who uh, submitted video clips reacting to Thelonious Monk. We, we put it out in the community. We had students from the Monk Center, from our family, um, from various schools throughout the district. And it, thank you, young people. You really did a great job. Um, it, few things I'd like to notate. Um, we have a drawing for those of you who would be so kind as to go to the link tree and to complete the pre-survey and the post-event survey. If you do that for us, that's going to give us some uh, good information about the demographics of this group. And um, we'll, we'll be able to be in touch with you for future events. So to thank you, we're going to have a drawing. Someone in the in the group is going to win some diamond accent jewelry, gift certificates, and other prizes. So please go to the link tree and uh, fill out those surveys for us. Thank you so much. And um, let's see, I'd also like to just take this time to thank our incredible committee. We had a group of people who've worked on this event for months and for fear that I might forget to thank them later, I'd like to thank them in advance. So thank you to my cousin, Thelonious Spear Monk III, to his beautiful wife, Gail Monk, Phyllis Cumming Texera, Dean Charles Collier from Quinnipiac University, Linda Jackson from Yale University School of Medicine, attorney Tina Beeman, Gary Monk Sr., Spencer Lucky from Lucky Playscapes, Celeste Beatty and Rose Hunter from Rocky Mount, North Carolina. Lauren Bass Sanford from Yale Undergraduate Jazz Collective. Bonnie Johnson, WICN in Worcester, Massachusetts. Douglas Holloway, Dudley Flake, Dr. Nicole Ivey from George Washington University. Duran Flake, Eliza Flake Benitez, Dr. Burl Irene Bailey, Brian Flowers, Keto Covington, Otis Brown, Jaquana Souls, James Harriet, Lauren Bass Sanford, and Maketa Flake Brown. So as you can see, we've had quite a few people who have donated, you know, just dedicated, 
quite a bit of time and love to this effort. So we're going to keep moving. I'd like to introduce you to our host for the evening, our moderator. Uh, her name is Bonnie Johnson. She's a producer and host of The Colors of Jazz, a weekly program streaming from streaming live from Worcester, Mass. On, the, on NPR affiliate WICN Public Radio. Inspired by arts and culture, youth and literacy, Bonnie is committed to engaging with people of all ages. Her professional career has evolved from database engineering, software development, and cloud computing, to consulting as a diversity, equity, and inclusion leader. She holds a master's of science degree in communication and information management from Bay Path University. Bonnie's contribution of time to boards and nonprofit organizations has broadened her collaborative reach into the global community, especially through music. Welcome, Bonnie, and thank you for serving as our event moderator. Thank you so much, Marcella. It's great to be here, great to see you virtually, and thank you everyone out there for watching and joining us tonight. Um, I also want to pay homage to the sites that we all reside and work on, uh, the land that is of indigenous peoples. I personally am in Worcester, Massachusetts. The peoples of Massachusetts and their neighbors of the Wampanoag and Nipmunk peoples who have stewarded this land for hundreds of generations. It's very important for us to remember that. And so I just call that out uh, as we speak. Also to acknowledge where you are, where you work, where you live, make music, teach, learn to the students who are watching, creating, watching and watching this live stream and building our communities. Also want to acknowledge the, acknowledge, uh, the origin of jazz being rooted in the African diaspora, the social call and the drum, the African drum. And without further ado, I just wanna say welcome again and jump right in by bringing our panelists to the virtual stage. I'm so excited uh, to introduce you to Dr. Nicole, Ivy of George Washington University in Washington, DC, serving up excellence in the histories of science and medicine, black visual culture, feminist theory, the list goes on and on in the area of black studies. Dr. Ivy received her joint PhD in African American studies and American studies from Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. She is classically trained on the <laughs> piano. She is a museum futurist. If you've not heard of what that is, let me just tell you, she has amplified the role of museums and arts organizations promoting equitable futures very important as we share the legacy of Thelonious Monk this evening. She will be helping us to better understand the existence of racial disparities in healthcare, education, and other institutions. Welcome, Dr. Ivy. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have a stellar lineup of panelists. I'd like to introduce you all to saxophonist Wayne Escoffery, who was born in London, England. His mom moved to the United States, landing in Connecticut, where she, and by the way, New Haven, Connecticut, she embarked on getting Wayne educated and turned him on to the Trinity Boys Choir where he began taking um, music theory, singing, and then began taking saxophone lessons from one Malcolm Dickinson. At age 16, he left the choir and began a more intensive study of the saxophone. 
a little bit about him uh, today. And well, let's see, he was awarded a full scholarship and attended the Hart School where he studied with Jackie McLean, world-renowned saxophonist and mentor of many. He received his bachelor's degree in jazz performance, summa cum laude. We raise him up as he attended the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz Performance at the New England Conservatory in Boston, Massachusetts. During this time, he had the chance to tour with pianist Herbie Hancock. Really an amazing career already embarked for him prior to moving on and being raised up by Downbeat Critics, uh, the Downbeat Critics Poll. In 2010, he won a Grammy uh, with the Mingus Band, so many awards. He has recorded something like 15 or more albums as a leader, and right now has some very special recordings that have just been released. As we speak, it would, I would be remiss if I didn't mention his album, The Humble Warrior on Smoke Session Records, and He's a founding member of the Black Art Jazz Collective. Further, Wayne Escoffery is a lecturer at the Jazz Improvisation Program at Yale School of Music as part of Yale University's Jazz Initiative. This is a very special post and we are pleased to welcome you, Wayne. So good to see you. It's an honor to be here. All right. And Wayne will be weighing in uh, with his musical perspective and all of his life experience coming up as an African-American leader in jazz. Now I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Robin D.G. Kelly. Dr. Robin D.G. Kelly wrote a book. If you can get to the library I want you to go and get this book. It is many chapters long. It is entitled Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of an Orig American Original. A little bit about Dr. Robin D. D. Kelly. He's coming to us from UCLA where he attended university. He has a uh, amazing track record for relaying historical, social justice issues, bringing them to the forefront, bringing his intelligence to the conversation. And as a matter of fact, I recently interviewed a young jazz pianist by the name of Samora Pinderhughes and his reference to Dr. Robin D.G. Kelly made my heart sore, understanding that generations are being introduced to this long life of jazz, the music that we know. And so I just wanna say welcome, Dr. Kelly. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, you are there at UCLA right. doing your thing. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And uh, just to know, you came, up, you came up in New York City, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Originally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, he's got a very good perspective on where Thelonious Monk is coming from. <laughs> Next, we have T.S. Monk. Thelonious Fear Monk III. He is, in fact, the son of Thelonious Monk, and I just had a chance to talk to him a few weeks ago. Some of you may have watched the clips, the films, or maybe heard our interview on WICN. Got a lot of energy talking about his dad and his legacy of music. T.S. was born in New York City. He too is a musician, a jazz drummer. He got to learn how to play the drums right there with his dad as his dad played music with friends and associates. I mean, people like 
Well, I could name them, and then you may already know John Coltrane. You already, you may already know some of the people who walk through the doors of the Monk family household. Welcome, T.S. I could just go on and on about the legacy and carrying on founding and making the felonious monk institute come to life carrying on your sister boo boo bobber's dream uh, uh, the legacy of your family and uh we just want to say thank you so much and listen i i want to thank you i'm delighted to be here and uh i mean uh you know this is an extraordinary group you have here i want to uh applaud Wayne, he's one of the uh, folks, you know, that uh, went to the Institute that, and it really, really shows, you know, I'm real, real proud of him. And uh, <clears throat> I think we're uh, getting ready to embark on quite, quite an endeavor having chaired the Monk Institute for 28 years. You know, I know when people know how to get it done and, you know, everybody, including you, Marcella, have been getting it done. So let's uh let let's talk. All right. Sounds good to me. Let's talk. I want to jump in. I've got a number of topics that uh I would love to have us touch upon. Uh there are so many aspects of Thelonious Monk's life uh that resonate with what's going on today. And um as we think about the man, his music, and bridging the racial divide. To get us started, I want to share a quote and ask each of you to weigh in. Just take a minute or two and share what comes to mind right off the bat, and then we'll really dig deep mm -hmm. into some real uh, important matters. Everything we share tonight is important, but I want to jump in with a quote. Thelonious Monk, if you really understand the meaning of bebop, you understand the meaning of freedom. Mm -hmm. Oh, I get it. <laughs> uh, I, you know, I can, I can begin, you know, uh, you know, jazz really uh, is the, munic uh, the musical manifestation of this whole democratic experiment we call America. Uh, if you really look at the fundamental elements of jazz, <clears throat> they comport with the fundamental elements of democracy. And I think that that is because uh, we're talking about an art form that was uh, invented by the children of slaves. And, and so slavery was, was right there for them. And uh, those things that were denied the slaves, you know, oppressed people have a tendency to uh, talk about uh, their problems and their wishes, their dreams and aspirations in their art. And you find that throughout cultures throughout history. And so these children of slaves invented a music that said everybody's got something to say because they didn't have the opportunity to say something. And it said, everybody's in, everybody's in, everybody's, you know, we're all in because they weren't allowed to be in, you know. And, you know, there's a dedication of the team to the individual and the individual to the team, right? That you find in a jazz band, you know? Uh, and all these elements are the basic elements of democracy. And, and democracy, you know, is really the closest thing to freedom. True democracy is the closest thing to freedom, I think, that humanity has to offer. You know, and so that's how I take that 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 statement from my dad. Mm -hmm. Who's next? Shall I read it again? I, I have some, no, I have, I have some thoughts. 
I mean, um, can you all hear me okay? Yes. yes. Sure. Cool. I mean, uh, you know, uh, bebop music is really, in many ways, the soundtrack of, um, of the African-American struggle, uh, really, uh, uh, particularly in the civil rights era, but, you know, starting after Reconstruction. And um, that struggle is the fight for freedom. Um, uh, so it, it makes perfect sense that you would you would um, you know equate uh, bebop with freedom. The other thing is um, you know you can't really be free until you look you can look your devils uh, in the mirror, look at your devils in the mirror, and come to terms with those. And I think in many ways that's what this uh, crazy experiment of America is. It's it's Americans from different places looking in the mirror and yeah. and, and and fighting fighting with those with those demons and um you know the, the jazz music and bebop of course in particular is uh has always been um you know that uh that music of 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 integration um mm -hmm. and and everybody coming to terms with themselves and uh, you know integration might seem like an easy thing but it's not we've, we've right. seen it, you know so right. yeah that's that's definitely bebop and freedom is, is all is all related yeah I, i'll jump in I mean, it's so interesting because um um, I couldn't agree more with both um, T.S. and Wayne. In fact, he took the words out of my mouth. <laughs> and it's so interesting that the, the musicians are talking about politics. And that's what I was going to talk about, politics. But let me talk about specifically the music, um, because it's a great quote. And, you know, Thelonious deserves credit for being one of the inventors of that particular kind of subgenre of jazz, of, of bebop. And in many ways what he was doing in the 1940s uh, was really breaking some of the, the limits of Western music at the time, harmonic limits, rhythmic limits. Um, and he was pushing boundaries in ways that people weren't quite ready for it. And yet almost all the people that we associate with the founding of, of quote unquote bebop music, which is just an extension of jazz. Which, in fact, bebop is what um, Duke Ellington called the Marcus Garvey extension. As <laughs> he called it the Marcus know. Garvey extension. I know. You got to remember that. That's great. That's um, great. But the one thing I just add to that is that, you know, Dizzy, Bird, they all were showing up and, and, and to, knows this so well. They were showing up trying to learn about harmony from, th from Monk, you know, learning about alternative chords to the point where they, they stretched harmony way beyond kind of traditional confines. They're playing way beyond the changes. And so that in some respects, yeah. when he says the meaning of bebop is the meaning of freedom, he's opening up freedom for everyone and paid a price for that, for those who are not ready for it, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's in addition to everything that's been said, which is absolutely right. This is a music that that is an expression of democracy, it's an expression of a striving for freedom, and it's an expression of the post-war civil rights um, rebellion. All of that is, is all, all in play. I love it. Thank you. And I would only add um, to what's been said that I think uh, from a linguistic standpoint, the meaning of bebop being freedom is so intriguing to me because bebop comes from the term comes from scatting. And so thinking about what is the meaning of freedom? What does it mean to define freedom through something that seems on its face nonsense, um, but really is at its heart, a kind of practiced brilliance. So the idea of like defining bebop as freedom just links to what already has been said about, you know, thinking a historical through line from the complex origins of American democracy and into the post-war, uh, post-World War II moment, beginning of the civil rights, the long civil rights struggle um, to define freedom as nonsense, um, kind of made sensible through practice and um, fellowship, I think is something that stands out to me. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, girl. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Well, I want to talk a little bit about the family migration. Uh, Thelonious Monk was born in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. And mom, T.S. 
your grandmother, mm -hmm. uh, decided to move the family to New York. Yes. And they ended up in San Juan Hill, an area named thus because uh, there were veterans, African-American mm -hmm. veterans of the military who were sort of housing was set up. This is where they landed after the Spanish War. Uh, and this is, in fact, the neighborhood that became Thelonious Monk's home. His family, friends, they, as children, spent lots of time in community center and learning to play instruments. Kind of interesting. At that time, as a child, he would be introduced to music. Mm -hmm. And so there are so many topics that we can touch on, but something that stood out for me is um, Thelonious was a very good student and then he had gone into high school where he had to take a train for miles traveling outside of the neighborhood. Uh, and his excellence shifted, but a whole lot went on in between. So I just wonder if we could talk a little bit about life and living, housing and education uh, in the time of Thelonious Monk and mm -hmm. just how that sort of wraps around where we are today. If we could right. sort of vibe off of that idea. Yeah, I could jump in and we just thought, oh, there we go. Here I am. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My say... computer just shut down on me. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> yeah, because I, I wanted to make sure T.S. got that, that question. I mean, I'll, I'll jump and say a few words. And of course, T.S. lived it. Um, but just two things to begin with. One, um, I do want to acknowledge that on that great migration, um, Barbara Monk bringing her three kids on the train brought with her North Carolina as well. Mm -hmm. And so I want to make sure, because one of the things I want to acknowledge is the role that the Monk family, especially um, uh, Pam Monk Kelly as a historian, has really kind of collected so much of this history uh, that I was able to take advantage of in, in writing my book. And, and so in, in my book, I, I deal a lot with, with North Carolina and that history is extremely important. And then the move North. And so they brought North Carolina with them and they moved, I mean, you know, Barbara moved there because there was no high school for black people in Rocky Mount, you know? So to get an education, she moved to New York with a cousin and ended up in the area of San Juan Hill, which for those who may not be familiar, we're talking about the West 60s, um, you know, West 60s, 50s, upper 50s, uh, in an area which is sort of behind where Lincoln Center is today, but it wasn't there then. Um, and they moved into a place called the Phipps Houses, which were the first um, sort of high quality uh, uh, working class homes for black families. You know, the Phipps, Phipps Foundation, or Phipps, Henry Phipps, the entrepreneur, had built homes for white working class families, but this is the first for, for black families. So these were the best of the apartments in the neighborhood that were mostly tenant, tenement apartments. And in a neighborhood that was very segregated in the sense that you had black and Afro-Caribbean people living on the streets and uh, mostly white ethnics living on the avenues. And so you, you talked about the migration going cross town to go to Stuyvesant High School. Um, for Thelonious and his brother and sister, just walking to the local elementary and uh, junior high school was dangerous and treacherous because they had to fight gangs on the corner mm -hmm. and the kind of violence that they dealt with. So one of the reasons why it was called San Juan Hill, in addition to the history that you just laid out so beautifully, is that it was a place that was just, um, uh, wrought, just wrought with, with racial violence yeah. uh, that continued. Throughout that, throughout that period. And so one of the reasons why, you know, Thelonious came out just so he and his brother, his brother was a boxer, um, mm -hmm. so resilient was because of what they had to deal with in this working class community. And one last thing I should say about it is that it's a neighborhood with, that was full of musicians, people whose day jobs sometimes were like, you know, domestic worker were also, you know, playing piano, um, and, and trumpet and other instruments, full of musicians. 
and full of professionals who through the Columbus Hill, Columbus Hill Community Center would actually like, just like Monk Youth Jazz, would do the exact same thing, work with the youth, provide all the skills and knowledge to help young people come up and grow up with skills, you know? And so it was a, really an amazing tight-knit community that wasn't defined by the violence. It just happened to be the condition. It was defined by the love that people had for one another. Anyway, I know others have lots to say about it. Yeah, uh, you know, it was very interesting because the uh, Thelonious was surrounded by some very historic uh, figures and, 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 and places. You know, the 63rd Street Playhouse is where uh, Noble Sissel and Newby Blake, you know, mounted uh, Shuffle Along, which became the prototype for the American musical. And uh, James P. Johnson lived close by. And uh, in fact, uh, Robert Bell, who, uh, uh, Robert Bell Sr., uh, live, live there, uh, you know his son, Robert Bell Jr., cool, from Cool in the Gang. Uh, he lived, he lived, yes, he lived, he lived in the buildings. And uh, of course, uh, I, I believe it was uh, Robert Bell Sr.'s brother, Tommy Bell, that was the only guy that, you know, when you used to hear the, the older folks talk, they would talk about boxing because my uncle was a boxer. And uh, they said, they would always say, oh man, the only guy to really whip Sugar Ray Robinson when he was coming up was Tommy Bell. And Sugar Ray Robinson went up to the top and Tommy Bell disappeared. It's kind of like with Muhammad Ali and a guy named Doug Jones, who, who really, really took, took Muhammad Ali to the wall. But, uh, and, and, you know, Thelonious, he always felt, that uh, it was so appropriate to have built uh, Lincoln Center in his neighborhood. Mm. That, was, that was really important to him uh, because he loved that neighborhood. You know, I was doing a, uh, an interview last night and I was asked, well, when Thelonious was on the cover of Time Magazine, like, did he tell anybody, you know, was that like, how did he feel about it? I said. As I recall, uh, he went up to Pat's bar on the corner of 64th Street where all his boys that he had grown up with used to hang. And he was really more interested in how they felt about him being on the cover of Time Magazine than he was any critics or any other musicians for that matter. So that neighborhood, you know, and, and in 1948, they began the construction of a housing project, a New York City housing project, was, which almost surrounded the Fifth Houses. And I remember uh, as a child feeling kind of special because we, we were in the Fifth Houses and it was next to the projects, but it wasn't the projects. And I had no idea at that time, you know, the reason that they had been built. I, I, I can still remember the, the buildings that they were built in 1906. And, uh, you know, uh, but there was something very, very special about that group. It's a group of eight buildings on 63rd and 64th Street. And everybody in there, mostly uh, people from the West Indies were, were in the buildings. But I, I believe even Mary White Overton uh, lived in the buildings for a time, you know, the founder of the uh, NAACP. So, I mean, it was just, just a rich, rich, community. And as Dr. Kelly had said, Columbus, you know, said he, was, he had to fight his way through the Irish kids, you know, down in the 50s to get to school every, every single day, every single day. But the most amazing thing about that, you know, is that uh, I think the riot of 1905 uh, uh, started uh, with uh, started in that neighborhood with some African Americans protecting protecting a Jewish merchant guy with a you know pushing a cart had a street cart uh, and you know so the African American community you know has so often has been accused of rioting 
when they were actually doing the right thing. And in that case, they were protecting a white person and then they were persecuted for being black by white people. It's, you know, America is just a basket case. It really, really is. You know, you know if I may, interestingly enough, uh, I actually live right now on 70th and Amsterdam. Um, 70th, there's 70th and Broadway actually. So it's right on the edge of San Juan Hill where, where everything that you guys are talking about, you know, um, went down and, uh, you know, there's, there's 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 so many thoughts going through my head about this. I mean, first of all, I first got introduced to what San Juan the, what San Juan Hill was uh, through through Robin's book. You know, I, I didn't really understand the rich history of this area until I read until I read your book. So I was grateful for for, mm-hmm. for that information. Um, and um, and and of course, it's very fitting that Lincoln Center is here, and I'm glad to hear that 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 Thelonious was 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 happy about that. Um, but you know, being here, I've I've lived in this area now. I just moved in this area uh, in August, and I'm only going to be here for for a short amount of time. It's a short period of time to be here. And, you know, I'm, when I moved to New York City in 1999, I moved to, I moved to Harlem, 153rd Street. And I was thrilled to live there because my mentor and teacher, Jackie McLean, lived there. That's his neighborhood. And, you know, in fact, the Sugar Hill, that's the, you know, Sugar Hill and, and, and Sonny Rollins and, and Duke Ellington. So I was thrilled to live in that area. Although when I moved in there, I was kind of like, you know, ducking through <laughs> and then running in my apartment. And I was like, I'm sure it'll get better, you know. But, um, you know, and then after that, I moved to the Bronx. It was much of the same. Um, and, and I mentioned to you earlier um, before we came on that I, I, I got remarried and, and um, um, you know, we wanted to move because of the pandemic, we wanted to move to a bit of a, a bit of a more convenient area where, um, you know, where we could both maneuver and do what we had to do without taking too much public transportation. Um, and I just say all this to say that 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 housing inequity is a real real thing in this in this in new york city and it's and it's more apparent here i think in many ways in a lot of other places and it's 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 really it's it's really disheartening at times and like i said i was really honored to live um in sugar hill because of the history of jazz there and the history of my my teacher uh honored to live in the bronx for the same reason but and but having but having raised a, a young kid through the through the the, the New York City public school systems living in Harlem and trying to get him in a decent school um, uh, and the way, you know, schooling is distributed here. Um, and then after living uptown with my people for, you know, 20 years and now moving to the Upper West Side, which is transformed and now is a, is a, is a you know, upscale area, um, it, feels, it feels unfair. You know, it feels unfair that, that I can walk across the street and go to a, a you know, a, a store that has cheap organic delicious food very easily when, you know, I deserved that. And everybody that was my neighbor deserved that in Harlem. You know, why can't, why can't they walk across the street and get a, get a, a thing of kale for $2 and, 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 and eat healthy? You know, I mean, why, why do I have to walk out here and I can go to Central Park and I can get my little espresso and I can enjoy myself and feel dignified? Why do I get to do that when I should have been able to, you know, be able to do that all this 20 years when I was in Harlem in the Bronx? And it's really, you know, it makes me feel great to be here and I love it. And the history that you guys are talking about is great. But a lot of that is gone and everyone's been disfranchised, disenfranchised. And it's it's a, it's a crazy reality. You know, it really is. You know, uh, there's one little factoid that I'd like to add for for everyone to, to understand about Thelonious Monk and how much he loved his neighborhood. So in 19, I believe it was in either 65 or 66, Thelonious finally earned enough money to move us out of the tiny, tiny apartment that we were in, 243 West 63rd Street, right? So my mother tells me we're moving and we're moving to a high rise Right, and you know, so it's, you know, like the Jeffersons, we moving on up. We, you know, where we moved, we moved two blocks away into the <laughs> towers, and so that the audience could go right back to Pat's bar. You know, now it was two, it was two blocks away, but I mean, we did not leave the neighborhood. We did not leave the neighborhood, and and when I got older, I. Un- understood that he he really you know i used to be on my father's shoulders and he would walk up 63rd street to amsterdam avenue and at that time across amsterdam avenue there was no lincoln center uh it was basically white uh uh, white folks and it was all tenements 
but he would walk up 63rd Street like the king of the world with me on his shoulders. And I, I'll never, ever forget that feeling of being on my dad's shoulders. I can, I can feel it right now. But he really loved that neighborhood. And he loved so many of the people in that neighborhood. And he never, he never got full of himself. He never got full of himself. He was beloved. I mean, it was kind of amazing. Everybody loved Monk, loved Thelonious. He was a really nice man. Mm. Yeah. I just want, before we, we move on to the next question, Robin referenced um, a book written by my sister, Pamela Monk Kelly. And I just like to show this. It's a shameless plug. I don't know if you can see it or not, but it's entitled All Roads Lead to Newton Grove. And it's the history of the Monk family. So Pam has obituaries. She has in-depth uh, research concerning our family roots, going back to the plantation um, to which, you know, where our great grandfather was held until he was 13 years old. So, um, if, you know, two very, very important reads, and I'm going to get out of this, but two very important reads. I, I made sure I brought both books with me, All Roads Lead to Newton Grove and Robin Kelly's book. I have the original, the first yeah. thing. That's, 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 that's the one I have. That's the one I yes, have. Yes, this is a flattering <laughs> copy. Thank you very much, Robin. Um, nice. Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of an American Original. And both books are available on um, Amazon. So you may continue. Absolutely. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Co commercial. Well, that was a commercial. Yeah. <laughs> well, so, you know, as we speak about, uh, Thelonious's upcoming, something that struck me was his exposure to outdoor concerts and fresh air camp as a child and the influence that that had on his life. Um, and so just to note, he had been introduced to Ragtime and Stride, as you mentioned, musicians lived in the neighborhood and uh, his mother, Barbara, loved gospel hymns and pushed the kids towards singing, similar to Wayne's life in many ways and probably all of our lives. How, how many of us came up with church and choir and <laughs> Absolutely. Thus? So, and I'm sure there are many watching now who can uh, say the same, but truly uh, had a profound impact on Thelonious. As a child, he actually was raised up, and Robin, you could speak to this maybe a little clearer for me. He was raised up, what it reminded me of, they created like an ad, and Thelonious became sort of the, the poster child for the fresh air camp, almost like a marketing uh, tool. He yeah, he was. Face. He was. The, yes. Yeah, he was the ma he was the yeah. mascot for the fire department up there. So what they would do, the fresh air uh, camps would basically bring kids, working class kids, poor kids, lots of kids of color, um, by train up to Batavia, uh, which is not too far, by the way, from mm -hmm. Attica. That's an interesting irony, but um, Batavia, New York. And they would live with families. And the idea was when they get there, they would, they would weigh them and they would go on scales to see how much they weighed. So the idea is that when they go back home, they would be heavier because they're being cared for by these families. And so, um, I mean, this inter interesting, complicated politics there. But uh, what, I, what was fascinating is, you know, they, that, that Thelonious wasn't just selected as the mascot for the fire department and you know he was he also led the the march of the children when he was five years old playing drums you know so i mean he had you could see both as a performer but as a musician as someone with that kind of skill and talent and leadership it was there um but let me just add one real quick thing about that neighborhood that's related to that experience with music i mean the Goldman band, Goldman's band used to perform free in Central Park. And one of the things I really appreciated uh, Wayne's comment, because as as housing becomes an issue and the cost of living becomes an issue, one of the things we're also losing is, you know, free 
culture. You know, the idea that he can he his mother could take the kids out to Central Park and listen to all the music from, mm -hmm. you know, all Western music and, and like absorb it and learn it without having to pay anything for it. You know, wow. that was the summers in the park. Um, and then the other thing, one last thing is that I want to hold up the name of Alberta Simmons. Alberta Simmons was a black woman who lived in the neighborhood who was his piano teacher. He had another piano teacher, formal teacher, people have written about named Simon Wolf. But Alberta Simmons was an amazing stride pianist who knew UB Blake, who knew James P. Johnson, who wow. knew Willie the Lion, who was part of the Clef Club. She had her own trio. She had an interracial trio, in fact, that we used to play up in Saratoga Springs. She had two white dudes playing behind her, and she was a piano player. So this is way before Benny Goodman talked about integrating bands, you know? Mm. And she had a gig, a regular gig she played. She couldn't make it. And so by 1925, she ended up, you know, scrubbing floors, but also teaching piano. And so Thelonious learned a lot from her. her his left hand, a lot, comes from what she taught him. And she was completely unsung, you know, um, up to this point. So that's what it meant. You know, when we talk about um, uh, the, the village raising Thelonious and all the people around him and the kind of um, community and education he got it goes way beyond what happens in school. It has to do with that community coming together and really raising him up and teaching him. And, and, and he gave them credit, by the way. Always, always gave people credit. That's awesome. All right. Well, you know, um, mm, you talked about Attica. I want to talk a little bit about this notion of the pipeline to prison. And let's talk about Thelonious's challenges with getting a cabaret card. And maybe a little bit of background for folks who are watching. A cabaret card was required in order to work, uh, to perform. For example, if Wayne wanted to play tonight, TS wanted to play tonight, they would need that card, like your driver's license. You would need that card to perform. However, Thelonious was challenged on every turn and in fact faced imprisonment uh, in an effort to perform. So can we talk just a little bit? Can y'all weigh in uh, your thoughts around this topic? Well, I think it I think it extends beyond that because Thelonious was not immune to the brutality of you know law enforcement uh, as experienced by most African American men in his era, you know, and he was he was beaten rather severely uh, more than once, you know, uh, once in Delaware and. You know, the, 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 the police precinct was the 23rd precinct uh, in, in the neighborhood. And I mean, we all always looked at that building as someplace that you did not want to go. It was uh, full of uh, white American cops and they didn't have good feelings about the neighborhood. Uh, and so, you know, the the taking of cabaret cards was just an extension of, you know, of the many extensions, the many ways that African-Americans were limited. Not only uh, uh, musicians, we were denied union memberships and all, all kinds of things. I think, you know, <clears throat> Dr. Nicole or, or Dr. Kelly can, can speak further on that, but I just wanted people to know that, you know, Thelonious, you know, getting his cabaret card taken away was the least of his worries when it came to the greater society and the way it approached African American males. Oh, uh, Dr. Ivy. Oh, jump in. Um, well, I, you know, I was just thinking about the cabaret card as part of. Um, that tension that right. the discussion was dis was talking about momentarily uh, just a few moments ago around what life in San Juan Hill was like at the mid in the mid 20th century for African Americans living there, and um, one of the things that I think about was 
the way that Sadia Hartman characterizes the intimacy in that neighborhood mm -hmm. in um, her last book, Wayward Lives. And so if you think about the vulnerable intimacy of black creators in a space um, in, New York, in New York City, you know, in the mid 20th century, part of that vulnerability is enforced by police. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the same way that Wayne was talking about legacies of policing and the problems you know, mm -hmm. around space and spaces to be free and to live for black people in the city right now, um, it links back to that longer, to a, a longer 20th century history of like a, oppressive per police curtailment of places for black life and black freedom. Mm -hmm. Um, and we still made life and freedom anyway. Um, you know, I just want to make a note about the cabaret card. It was a, you know, a frequent tool of enforced employability. Um, Billie Holiday suffered, uh, you know, and a lot of the folks that um, Robin Kelly writes about, you know, a lot of the folks that we've also named as being part of that neighborhood circle um, of of black genius that surrounded and produced Monk. Um, that community was surveilled and kept from performing. You know, just I'm just thinking about the legacies of um, law and order that are that still aim to limit black creativity today. Right. So I'm, I'm thinking about that and thinking about that being. Um, part of what produces the love that Monk has for the neighborhood too. Mm -hmm. So even though you can't, you know, even though he is under surveillance and under threat of criminality, um, you know, he still is able to remap a kind of geography in that space um, outside of the policing right. that, that meant to limit his, his brilliance and creativity. Right. See, that's a, that's a great, great, br brilliant intervention. Um, in fact, on geography, if I could just add one thing to the, the cabaret card story. Um, well, two things real quickly. One is that just so people understand, um, the cabaret card was rendered unconstitutional, so it doesn't exist anymore. Um, there's been a big fight against it. And, and one of the reasons it was rendered unconstitutional is because the police issued it. This was not... This was not an official thing. And the police issued cabaret cards to everyone who worked in any um, establishment that served alcohol. So it wasn't just musicians. It was what the cabaret card was invented to, to break the union of dining hall workers and you know wait staff and, and musicians to really break them, make them accountable to police. And then the police used it in a very racialized way. Um, but the amazing thing, and talk about geography, and this is one last thing I would say, you know, everyone, you know, before I wrote the book, every, if you read anything about Monk, they'll say, well, you know, in those days, Thelonious didn't work at all. He just was like, just out of work until he got his cabaret card back. And so he lost in 48, got it back, then 51 lost it, 57 got it back, 58 lost it, 60 got it back. And, and 58 was when he got beat by the police. But but it's not true. When you read the black press, when you read the black newspapers, you discovered that Thelonious worked a lot. But where? In black owned clubs in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, you know, and, and T.S. knows this because he yeah. you know, went with him. I mean, places like in, in Brooklyn, for example, Tony's Club Grand, on Grand and Dean. The 845 Club in the Bronx, places in Harlem, for example, uh, where Jackie McLean would play. These are the places that were off the map in the history of jazz. They were just off the map. And so what I tried to do in the book was restore those places and realize mm -hmm. this is a man who worked hard all the time, never stopped working, you know, and because he had a family to take care of. And, and he was workmanlike in that sense that he and Nellie kept putting things together, put food on the table and took care of the kids, even when he didn't have a steady income at the more traditional places like the Vanguard or, you know, et cetera. So anyway, I want to, I know CS has something to add to that, but. Yeah, well, uh, the only thing I wanted to add was uh, the fact that he worked under the uh, 
pseudonym Ernie Washington, <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, which is funny. I, I think that's funny because later on in his career, uh, he was best friends with Art Blakey. And at one point, Art Blakey changed his name to Abdullah Buhena, mm -hmm. right? And my mother says, tells the story that, so Art comes over to the house and he tells Polonius, yo, man, you know, you need to change your name and get one of these, you know, really, hip, you know, Muhammad or <laughs> something like that. And Polonius, my mother said, Thelonious told him, he said, look, man, my name is Thelonious Sphere Monk. That's really happening. Your name is Arthur Blakey. So I understand <laughs> why you need to change your name. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's really funny. But that the whole that whole cabaret card thing, I mean it, you know, stuff like that follows us to this day. Follows I mean, it's all part of voter suppression and law and order, you know, which is something that I've been hearing all my life, you know, I first became aware of it with, with Nixon. That was the first president that I heard talking about law and order, law and order, law. And law and order <clears throat> is something that really, for the most part, has a, pertained to the uh, control of the African-American community and, and, and indigenous uh, uh, Native American community, you know, and the immigrant community in general, you know. I mean, we are the only ones that weren't not immigrants. We were kidnapping victims, uh, but the, the idea has, has been the same. So, you know, and during that period when he did have his card missing, I mean, my mother was a typical strong black woman. And there were times when she was working two jobs and three jobs while he couldn't work. But it's, it's a wonderful love story because she believed him. He'd be home doing a Mr. Mom thing when I was born and when my sister was born. I can still remember my dad, you know, with a with a wife beater on, you know, and he's sloshing dirty diapers because they didn't have hampers oh, or right. none of that in that day. So the right. whole diaper was a kind of a funky mess. But I remember Thelonious doing those things uh, and then writing music and my mother believed in him. I mean, boy, did she believe in him. I mean, it's it's just one of those stories that it's just a classic love story between them. You know, so even though he had his cabaret card taken away, uh, he always had a support system. He always had a support system with his mom, uh, with his brother living next door, his sister living uh, not far away. Yeah. And, uh, it, it was just it was a tough time, but it wasn't as tough as you may think uh, for him in terms of, you know, emotionally with his family. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, it's it's funny what makes me, if I may jump in, what, what um, you know, you're talking about that cap, that cabaret card and, 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 and losing it and how many people, how many musicians lost it during that time. And it makes me think of a lot of things. First of all, it makes me think about the resilience of, of, of black people. In, in this country and that and that we've always had this resilience since the very beginning just because we had to um and we find a way to work and and, and again my teacher jackie mclean uh he he lost his cabaret card many times and had to use the name john lenwood and ferris bender and whatever he had to do uh to 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 to, 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 to play the music um and it's just uh yeah, it's just it's just what's what I was going to say. What's what's interesting, what comes out of that a lot of times is some sort of other good comes out of these things. Right. So in the case um, you're talking about, you know, Thelonious, maybe one of the good things that maybe he got to spend more time at home with with his family, to, taking care mm -hmm. of that and, and, and playing, spending more time playing in these black cl clubs with Jack and McLean. He started uh, the Heart School of Music and, and, and started said, you know what, I'm just going to teach these kids how to play this music and ended up going. You know, no one ever thought that Jack and McLean would be some teach, world renowned teacher. He was a cat on the street, you know, doing his thing. Nobody thought about him like that. But because yeah. he lost his cabaret card, he was forced to do that. And so a lot, sometimes a lot of good comes out of these yeah. things like this. But the one of the interesting kind of, kind of uh, uh, problems with that in a way is because we're so resilient. And, and I come across this a lot when I talk to my white friends or colleagues about the plight of black people, which, you know, all of a sudden, a lot of white people are talking about it, you know, um, 
it's a it's a funny thing we end up discussing because they might ask, well, you know, it seems like sometimes the black community isn't fighting enough to do this or fighting enough to do this. The reason why is because we're spending so much time fighting to make money. We're spending so much time fighting to make a living, to take care of our kids and to figure out a way around what's being done to us. We're so resilient that you might not, in some ways, you might not even think anything happened. You know, mm. you might, they, they look at Thelonious' story and, and without people like Robin and, and, and T.S. telling his story, you might think, oh man, Monk was killing, he had all these records and he just, you know, was great and he got all the record deals and everything was cool because you don't really know all the obstacles he had because he was so busy fighting them mm. and succeeding. You know what I mean? So it's a double-edged thing. I mean, we're so resilient that oftentimes we end up not even fighting the other battle as to why did this happen? We need to make sure that this is happening to me and, it's, and, and, and it shouldn't be happening. You know? Okay. Could I jump in and just say one last thing? Uh, we all have to remember that despite all of these things that were going on, you know, it, it sounds like it was tough, but these were really happy young men. They yeah. were happy young men, and you hear it in their music, despite all yeah. this negativity yeah. surrounding them. And I recall when I was around them, and the house would be full of cats, and my father would take me to somebody's house and be full of these cats. These cats were laughing. They were joking all the time. I mean, all the time. There's, you know, and, and lots of times, you know, uh, the general public has had such negative views of the atmosphere that surrounded jazz as if it was this dark, you know, sort of melancholy kind of atmosphere, you know. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, that if you look, particularly if you take any of the artists we love, Miles Davis, Cannonball Adderley, John Coulter, and Thelonious Monk, Art Blakey, Max Roach, Charlie Parker, any of those cats, and look at their their early album covers, all you see is happy young men. They all look happy. Now, because yeah. they were realists, actually, if you go through their discography, you know, if you look at Miles' album cover, you know, in 1952, and he was so cute, and he had that big, pretty smile, and all the girls said, oh, Miles Davis, you know? And then you look at some of his album covers later in life, you can see the tax that he had yeah. to pay. You can see yeah. it in, in their faces. But I want people to understand that back in the 1930s and the 1940s, all of those guys, Charlie Parker, all those guys that became addicts, you know, that had substance abuse problems. They all started out as happy, happy young men aspiring to do wonderful things like any other American uh, youngster. On that note, speaking of happy, uh, for the folks who are watching, I just want to relay to you, if you're on YouTube or Facebook, go ahead and drop comments, questions. We'd love for you to address the panel here with any thoughts or questions you might have. Uh, but on the idea of being happy, something about Thelonious Monk, he was described as being avant-garde, you know, as we moved into sort of the 60s and you know, his dancing, he would move around and he would spontaneously dance. And it was noted that when he was feeling good and the music was swinging, then so was he. But something about Monk, he grew up in the church. He witnessed ecstatic expressions as Dr. Kelly has described in the book. But he also witnessed Jim Crow, the world of the Jim Crow, uh, what's the word? How do I describe that? Jim Crow time. And because he was, as a teenager, his mom allowed him to join a traveling evangelist where he played the music. He performed and played and traveled as a 17-year-old, 16-year-old, traveled the country 
was exposed to the South, opened his eyes to the disparities and just what was not right. And it had a profound impact. And later he, uh, as MLK came to the forefront, Martin Luther King Jr. came to the forefront uh, as the civil rights movement became bigger. Emmett Till was murdered. It had a profound impact on Nellie and Monk, the parents of T.S. and Barbara, they, you know, Boo Boo and Toot. They saw their child. But I want to raise up the fact that a recent album entitled Palo Alto was just released. And it is a recording that was captured in 1968 in the height of the civil rights movement. And so let's just talk about what that album means and the times uh, associated with that music. A teenage student engaged with Thelonious Monk to bring him into Palo Alto, California to his high school for a concert. And that recording is available now on an album. In fact, we're offering it for folks to take the survey. So get that survey done, post your questions, and panelists, please weigh in on this. Uh, you know, I, I, I want to let Robin really talk about that because he can really tie it all together. But I do want to uh, let everyone know that uh, Rolling Stone magazine this week uh, called Palo Alto uh, one of the top 10 uh, reissues uh, of 2020, along with Mick Jagger and Paul McCartney and all these people. Uh, and Monk sounds so good that they didn't know that it's not a reissue. <laughs> 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 it's a brand new, never released recording, but it sounds really, really great. But Robin, maybe you could speak to what was going on in Palo Alto at the time and how that ties in with Monk and with Danny Shear. Right, right. No, I will say I will say a few things. I don't want to say too much because you know the liner notes tell the whole story. So if you get the rec if you get the record, you can actually get the whole story. <laughs> you know, so I'm just saying. But um it's an amazing story. And in fact, I, I have to give T S a lot of credit because it was Danny Shear who reached out to TS and then had been sitting on this recording for years. So here's the backstory very, very briefly. Danny Shears is, you know, young Jewish. He was a junior in high school, rising senior at the time. And he had been organizing these jazz concerts at pa Palo Alto High School. And if you know about Palo Alto, there's Palo Alto, which is in the shadows of Stanford University, and then East Palo Alto, which is another neighborhood that was at the time almost entirely black and poor working class. Um, now it's mostly um, Latinx uh, and black, but it's still a working class community. And so Danny had this idea of bringing Monk, you know, Thelonious and his quartet was, they were playing across in San Francisco um, at the jazz workshop. And then he got, he figured it out, got it, agreed, Thelonious agreed to bring the, the band for this one Sunday afternoon concert. Uh, and it was a great success. But what Danny had to do was try to figure out how to get folks from East Palo Alto up to Palo Alto High School because it's a very segregated community. This is 1968. And in 1968, several things happened. One, Dr. King had been assassinated that April. Um, East Palo Alto had its own sort of mini rebellion against police violence. Um, the the Folks in East Palo Alto, some of the leadership had been organizing independent schools and had put on the ballot a referendum for East Palo Alto to succeed and change its name and, and call it um, Nairobi. And so at time when, when, when Thelonious was playing uh, this concert, which was for kind of uh, to raise money for the other work that Danny was doing around providing funds for um, uh, building projects in Africa and Latin America, uh, this referendum was going to be on the ballot the, follow the following week. And so the question was whether or not um, East Palo Alto would be able to incorporate itself, become Nairobi, 
you know, and make a kind of political statement and whether or not East Palo Alto and Palo Altoans can come together. So the concert was the opportunity for people to come together. So Danny's in East Palo Alto putting up posters saying, come check out this concert. And the brothers and sisters are like, really, monks coming to Palo Alto House? We don't believe it. He said, well, just show up. If you see him get out the van, then you could buy your ticket. If you don't get out, then don't buy the ticket. So they show up and, this, and Monk shows up and gives a great concert. I mean, I, I can't even describe the music. It is an astounding performance. Everyone is on fire. Everyone in that band is on fire. And Thelonious is playing so, so amazingly. And there was a black janitor whose name we still don't know, who actually made an agreement with Danny. He said, look, I'll tell you what, I'll get the piano tuned if you let me record it. And Danny's like, okay, it's cool. So he gets the piano tuned, he records it. And that recording from this black janitor who loved the music is why this record even exists wow. in the first place, wow. you know? And the rest of the outcome, I won't tell you, you can like read the notes. It'll tell you what happens next. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yes, uh, and I, I'd just like to say that um, I had the honor and the privilege of uh, restoring Thelonious Monk and uh, John Coltrane at Carnegie Hall about 10 years ago yes. with my uh, one of my best friends in the world. His name is Grand Mixer DXT. And for those of you who don't know DX, who DXT is, he's the guy that uh, played the scratching on Herbie Hancock's rocket <laughs> that virtually changed hip hop music, totally. But he is an absolutely brilliant engineer. And so I prevailed upon him a second time mm -hmm. for this Palo Alto recording. And that's why Rolling Stone is calling it a reissue because uh, this was a, 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 a mono recording recorded on a questionable recorder with uh, the janitor, so the engineer was questionable. <laughs> <laughs> and and yet and still, uh, together, but mostly DXT's expertise, we were able to restore this recording. So it really sounds like it was recorded last week. You know, uh, we utilized uh, the uh, best software available, all the technology available. And uh, it is really a wonderful recording uh, for those folks who really dig Thelonious Monk, this is one that you should have in your collection. And I don't say that uh, because I own part of the record. I say that because Thelonious was really important musically. And it's not that old. he was not recorded uh, the way, say, a Miles Davis spent his career at Columbia Records or John Coltrane spent his career on Verve or Il Impulse, uh, you know, or not, you know, Frank Sinatra on RCA. Thelonious was on, you know, he was on Blue Note, then he's off Blue Note, he's on Riverside, then off Riverside, on Prestige, off Riverside, on Columbia. And so there were these, there were a lot of gaps in his career and people wanted to hear Thelonious. So that's why, you know, tapes have been falling out of the sky of people that recorded Thelonious surreptitiously because they just wanted to hear Monk and Monk, he was not lucky enough to make as many records as he should have because companies would have faith in him and then they wouldn't have faith in him. You know, and I mean, we all who make records sort of suffer from that. But for someone as great as Monk to have to go through that really is, is, is a statement. And, uh, and a lot of it was because he was honest, he was forthright, and he took a position and he was not going to change that position for any record company. Uh, in fact, I'd like to just let everybody know that the record company, you know, Thelonious is, is in many circles thought of as kind of like the mad genius of jazz, you know. That was a construct of the record company. He did not like that. But you know what? He wanted to feed his family. And so he went along with the plan. And they sat him down and they told him, we're going to sell you as a, as like a, a mad genius, you know, like you're crazy. And, mm. and you know, that that's, some, that's one of the things that uh, Thelonious really didn't like. 
but it was a pill that he swallowed to feed to feed his family, you know. And uh, I'm very grateful uh, because I've had a very very good life. Uh, but he took a lot of lumps for me uh, and my sister. He he really really did. I have a a, a quick question before we wind down because we've got about ten minutes left. But Thelonious and and musicians in general seem to be ahead of the curve as far as race relations. Could you guys speak to that a bit and how jazz just seemed to, and particularly Thelonious's music, has seemed to be a unifying force. Could you please speak to that? Wayne? Uh, well, I mean, like I said earlier, you know, jazz has always been that, 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 inter that integrator and that unifier. Um, and, you know, I, I think to, to today, you know, I, I had a, was supposed to perform at the Blue Note tonight. Um, and instead, uh, I didn't. It got canceled. But I had a little pickup gig just near the, near the park here this afternoon. Some guys were playing and they texted me and said, you want to come play? And I said, sure, I'll come play for the heck of it. I, I want to play. I didn't know who it was going to be. And I go there and it's, uh, you know, another brother, young trumpet player. It was a brother plays plays great. Um, and then the bass player is a bass player I haven't seen in a really, really long time. A, you know, a white guy. Um, and he's a, he's a great bass player. And I'm sitting here and I'm, and I'm playing I'm, and, I'm, and I'm literally was just thinking this. I'm like, you know, it's funny because I don't really talk to this guy that much. You know, every time I do, I really I really enjoy uh you know, seeing him, we have a nice conversation, but I don't really talk to him or communicate with him that much. We don't talk on the phone, but when he plays those bass solos and when he's walking those lines, he is <laughs> speaking the same language, the exact same language that I'm speaking. And I know even without having the long, deep conversations, I know that he, there's certain things that he just understands the way that I understand them. Just because he went bip bop, double, 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 bop, bop, just because he did that. And I'm standing there and he knows what to do when I'm doing what I do. It's that it's that unifier, and that's it's just that's just it, the language does that to you when you really, you know, drop your your ego and drop you know whatever you're presenting or all that stuff and just embrace the language. It you embrace people, you embrace community. That's what this music is, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I personally would just weigh in. I I find that jazz has been a passport to the world, and so I imagine that the musicians. For example, Monk going to Paris, being invited to Paris to perform in a festival. You know, that um, chance to travel and meet folks, you all can speak to that better than I am sure. Well, you know, uh, the wonderful thing about this music is that although, you know, although jazz was invented in the African-American community, uh, it's a universal language. You know, uh, several years ago, we did, uh, we had International Jazz Day in Osaka, Japan, the Monk Institute in conjunction with uh, UNESCO. And that was streamed to 2.2 billion people. Wow. You know, and, but the most interesting thing was that I think the world is, uh, I think there are about 190 quote, countries that are recognized on the planet Earth. And uh, we had 186 countries uh, involved in International Jazz Day. And what I came to realize <clears throat> was jazz is the one genre that is played essentially in every country in the world. And there are countries, quite frankly, you put on a, a Michael Jackson record and I mean, you might get your head cut off, but jazz, and it's because it is a universal language. It's a universal language. You see, it goes all the way back to what I said in the beginning. It's about, and what Wayne was talking about, it's about unity, the music, you know, the principle behind the music is people getting together and uh, repressive regimes, right, have always repressed jazz because jazz makes people come together and jazz makes people think. Interestingly enough, though, the autocratic leaders in those repressive regimes all have 
jazz record collection. It's crazy. <laughs> oh, Dr. Ivy, you should, you should jump in here. Well, you know, I want to answer Marcella's question and be a, a good panelist, but I am uh, feeling pretty unruly <laughs> and I still <laughs> can't stop. <laughs> and I can't um, stop thinking about Bonnie's comment about the avant-garde. Mm. Um, and so I, I've been trying to make the avant-garde thing that's stuck in my mind fit into this discussion of universalism. And maybe it does and maybe it doesn't. Um, but I keep thinking, and thank you, Robin, for um, for drawing me out because I, when you were t in the book, when you talk about Monk's decision um, to get into mm. the wagon uh, for the for the cover of Monk's music, you know, um, I think about uh, you know when you talk about Monk being cutting edge and being avant-garde, that was an expression of joy. You know, um, as T.S. has said, like, even though there were, um, even though there was this overarching attempt to, to maybe single him out and make him as some kind of um, horrible exception, um, you know, one way that he reclaimed a kind of autonomy as an individual is by not doing, you know, not being so literal about right. being a monk, right. you know, not posing at a pulpit or, or something, some kind of gimmick, which was, I think, mm -hmm. the record company's original idea of what the album cover should have been. Um, he climbed in a wagon. And if I, if I'm Remembering this correctly, I think the wagon was something that he had. Yeah, with two. He was like playing with his own. That was your wagon. Yeah, that's the, that's where it comes from. T.S. He, he told me that story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was, look at that. And so that's so cool, you know, because I'm thinking about like what it means to um, maybe one of the things that makes jazz so universal is that it makes. And I mean, that's part of what the avant-garde does. Like it makes something new and meaningful. It makes meaningful use of, a friend of mine was just talking with me today about making meaningful use of what we have every day. So like mm -hmm. me meaningful use of the everyday. Um, and I was, you know, thinking about what it means for Monk in that moment to be both joyful and resistant um, to get what is absolutely a, a very like striking visual image. And it's something that resists the way that he was talked about, um, you know, resist this like mad genius gimmick that was produced externally to his, to externally to him. Um, you know, and so I'm thinking, I'm trying to hold on to like, how do I put avant-garde together with right. the universal? And maybe it is like, you know, jazz's ability to make meaningful use out of the, you know, out of human movements, out of, mm -hmm. um, out of experiences and sounds that were oppressed, you know, right, and right. that resist, um, that create their own kind of orthodoxy, right? So the, I'm thinking about like the orthodoxy of jazz as, as being its own kind of orthodoxy that hears Western classical traditions, but also devolves them, that hears um, spiritual mu music, like abide with me, right? And remakes it into something else. Um, right, right. So that's what I'm thinking about, like yeah. what it means to be a little bit unruly. Um, <laughs> I love it, I love it. No, you, it's so the the avant-garde becomes the traditional. Right. Mm. You know, the avant-garde really means you're just ahead of your time. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I love that phrase. <laughs> no <laughs> no I've been true. saying that for a number of years, but going back to what Robin had said, you know, there were um, there were things that Thelonious did harmonically mm -hmm. that, first of all, the critics called wrong. But beyond the critics calling it wrong, had he played those harmonics 200 years earlier, he'd either been 
tucked away in a tower or executed. Mm -hmm. Literally, literally, because, you know, and that's my son who handles, you know, the marketing for, for my father has a has a wristband that says wrong is right. Because Thelonious would always say wrong is right because the critics would say he was wrong. And it's a funny thing. Uh, in the past 20 or 30 years, I can't even find anybody anymore that says they didn't like Monk when he showed up. And I know for a fact there was a whole lot of people that did not like Monk when he showed up because they didn't get it. So, But the avant-garde, I think, is a word uh, that really goes to the issue of being ahead of your time, you know, and it, and you can apply that to Monk or you can apply that to Marcus Garvey mm -hmm. and Daddy Grace. Right, right, right. You no, know, well, if I could just add one last thing in here, because I know right. we got uh, just on on that connects all these all these responses, uh, the connection between avant garde and what is it about the music that can draw people out. And I think it's it's even deeper than universalism. It's that jazz, this music, and, and Thelonious being one of the, the main progenitors of this music, this music is a model for living. You know, we, we live in a society where we think yes. it's individual versus collective. Like, we, like these are, are somehow opposite. It's like you have to have individual, creative, to be ahead, or you've got to be like everyone else. And this is a music that requires both insistently all the time, individual voice, creativity, improvisation, invention, and collective, because you can't do this by yourself. And you got to think about how do you do that in a cooperative way? And so there's a way in which, you know, Thelonious was a great solo pian piano player, no question. He was a, probably the greatest of the 20th century, but he also knew what it meant to be in an ensemble. And to be in an ensemble and to push everyone to be their creative voice and find unity in that voice. And so it's all there. And imagine if that's a model for living, that's a model for anti-racism, that's a model for decolonization, that's a model for feminism, that's a model for living a world where we could actually be together and not have to lose ourselves in it. You know, that's the model. Raph on, Raph on. <laughs> yes, well. Yeah, I, I hear you. Well, I'd like to thank all of you. Now, we're not going to end. We're going to transition. So Bonnie and I are going to exit. And we have some young people who are waiting to talk to you. Okay. So we're going to, um, Bonnie, thank you so much for serving as our moderator. These great questions and keeping the conversation flowing. And I'll be back at the end, I hope, if they can get me back in. But right now, we've got some anxious young people waiting to come in. So thank, thank you, you so much. And if you guys don't mind, T.S., um, if the panelists, if you guys could continue just kind of talking and let me exit out and get Maqueda on and others on. We'll continue with the yeah. question and the answer segment. But before I exit, I just want to remind you that we have that uh, pre and post survey. We really would like to hear from you. Please go to the link tree to complete that. And don't forget, you know, if you have questions or comments that you'd like the young people to present to our panelists, please um, submit those questions to mbrown102118 at yahoo.com. So mbrown102118 at yahoo.com. You guys carry on and I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you. Dudley, you can take Bye-bye. All right. Thank you. You know, uh, I was I was just thinking, you know, this music is so tied uh, conceptually to the civil rights struggle that we've had in this country. It's it's really amazing. And and some of the players you know, people like Max Roach, people like Russell Roland Hurt were very much involved in in the movements, you know, in terms of civil rights in this country. They, you know, they, well, Rasan died rather early, but I think Max paid a price for some of the records he made, you know, and uh, 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 because he and Abby Lincoln 
I mean, they have a, an, an album that they did called, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I think it's called It's Free. Time. And, you know, I mean, the things that, that Abby and Max talked about, Max Roach was a, a great reader of books. He was, a, he, was, he was our intellectual guy. You know, of all the jazz musicians, it was it was Max Roach, and um, and so Thelonious. Uh, a lot of people don't know that Thelonious. You know, he played he played fundraisers for Paul Robeson and for the NAACP and all of that, because once you go around the world a little bit, and then you come back here, then you understand better what's going on here, and that's why you know jazz musicians always have a great opinion and you know wayne i know you 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 know this i mean you're a lot younger than me but you know you've been around enough to know that what you've seen in the world has made it you're better able to assess what's going on here in this country as a result of traveling the world and that's something that's very important for jazz musicians we don't talk about that enough hello my dear Hello, how are you? How's everybody? We're good. Very good. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for joining everyone. So my name is Maketa Flake Brown and I am Marcella Flake's daughter um, and Dudley Flake. He's off camera working behind the scenes tonight. Um, and we have some student participants today who are going to read some of the questions. Um, some came from them um, and some are coming from people who have emailed in some questions. I've been kind of trying to funnel those questions so we can get them to you. Um, so a little hectic, so bear with us. Um, but we can, I'll introduce you first to our student uh, uh, participants and then they'll start. Uh, Tyler Fisher is a senior at Hill Regional Career High School. He is a saxophonist and he's been involved with the Monk Center. Uh, it's a STEAM after school and summer program that we have uh, for the past four and a half years. And Tyler is a jewel, we love him. Kaden Wooten is a sophomore at Hamden High School. She's 15 years old wow. and she dances at the Tia Russell Studio in New Haven. Cash, oh, Cash is not here yet. He'll come, we'll go back. Uh, Kyle Beeman is a student at Hofstra University and his major is uh, music business. And then we have Isaiah here and I don't know where Cash is, but he might be on at some point. So let's uh, start off. Uh, with Kyle. Kyle, you can ask your first question. All right. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, my first question is for TS. When did you realize that your dad was famous? Oh, man. I'll, I'll, I'll make it short. I was 19 when I realized. I mean, I realized, I, I realized he was famous when I was young because of the way the people on the block reacted to him and he was making records. But who he actually was, I did not realize until I almost had an epiphany at 19 years old mm -hmm. uh, that um, one day I'll tell you what that was about. But it, it was very, very, very late uh, in, in, as, as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, sometimes when you grow up and you're so close to something, you don't realize what it is until you can stand back and take a look. And so it was, yeah, 19 years old was when I realized that Thelonious was he was daddy, but he was also this guy, Thelonious Monk, that people had been telling me about. You know, they were always telling me about, you know, do you know who your father is? And I'm saying, yes, that's daddy, right? And then at 19 years old, I realized that daddy was Thelonious Monk. Okay, thank and you. was that you playing the guitar? Yes. No. Uh, I just wanted to tell you, that's a good tune you wrote, man. Thank you, thank you. All right. All right, Kaden, did you wanna ask a question? Um, well, first, it's nice to meet everybody. 
Um, my question is for TS, and it was, how did your father influence you musically? Oh, um, you know, that's, that's a real hard one uh, because uh, I guess the best way to describe how he influenced me was my father kind of kept me on his leg, you know? So I went all over the place with him. I went to this one's house and that one's house and hung out in the club. And I think really what he wanted to do was he wanted me to uh, 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 get steeped in the philosophy because one thing you have to understand is that jazz is not a technique. We all use the same 12 notes, right? Whether you're Beethoven, whether you're P. Diddy, whether you're Thelonious Monk, whether you're Mick Jagger, it's only 12 notes. So we're all connected in that way. But the philosophy is what you apply to those notes, right? And jazz has a different philosophy than classical music, which has a different philosophy than hip hop, which has a different philosophy than R&B, right? So it's really about the philosophy that goes along uh, with, with jazz, you know? And uh, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's, really, that's really what it is. Thank you. So I will ask the next question. Uh, when did you find you had a love for music, Tia? Uh, golly, um, I don't know. You know, I don't know because I grew up, if you grow up in it, it's like in your blood. It's like, it's just there, you know? I just, I dug it, I, you know? I said, I, you know, I, I liked it, but I was a kid. I think that, no, one thing I will say is that I have found that young people really get Thelonious. I don't know what that is, but young people really get Thelonious better than a lot of adults do. Uh, I don't know if it's 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 his melodies or the jump in his music. I don't know what it is, but I do know that it has that effect. So I don't think I was immune to that effect. Okay, Tyler. Um, this question is for Dr. Kelly. This question says, how has learning about the life of Thelonious Monk influenced your view, your view of music and society? Oh, that, that requires <laughs> another book. <laughs> um, by the way, this, this is, a, I just wanted to say before I answer the question, there was a beautiful um, tribute at the beginning with all those young people who feel connected to the music. And I really appreciate the fact that so many young people said, when I listen to Thelonious, I feel calm and, you know, and I feel relaxed. And so in answering your question, um, you know, I've loved Monk since I can remember. I saw him in Central Park in 1969 at, when I was seven years old. Um, and I grew up with that music. And, you know, um, Jimmy Owens was my, my uh, trumpet teacher when I took trumpet at seven. You know, I, I gave it up very quickly. Um, and so I've always loved his music, but never thought I could I would ever write about him until one day I realized that if I had if I had one last book to write in my life, it would be about the life of this great musician. And so I threw 15 years of my life into that, you know, to write this book. And I'm I still feel like it's not done. So in many ways, it changed everything for me. It changed the way I listen, not just to his music, but to all music. And most important, this is the most important lesson. It made me realize that how important it is to see artists through the lens of the society they live in, the society they shape, and to follow the money. And what I mean by that is that we've got to understand that all of our great geniuses really would never really appreciate it fully in terms of the financial reward. And I think it's amazing that the values that Thelonious and Nelly brought to their family were values where they took the little bit of money they made. They never made a lot of money. I have, I have the tax returns. I know. They never made huge amounts of money. And there were points where one third of their income 
if not more, went to tuition for their kids, right? That's a decision about an artist. Yes. That's yes, not, you don't, you don't usually hear that. You usually hear, oh, how did they come up with this composition? No, they were making a life in a future for their children. And that was the most important thing for them and for Thelonious. And so to me, that was the thing I took away and, made, and gave me a model for living. These are beautiful answers. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kyle had another question. Yeah, so this question is for Wayne Escoffrey. So as someone who grew up surrounded by jazz, what influences from jazz can you hear in other styles of music? Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, in many ways, uh, uh, the, the innovations of jazz uh, are the foundations for all modern music. So, I mean, from the creation of the drum set itself, which is apparent in all forms of modern music, uh, to improvisation, which you can hear. Um, of course, you can hear imp improvisation in, in music, you know, uh, uh, preceding jazz, like, by, you know, by Bach, but you can also, you know, you know, you hear that improvisation in rock and roll music, you hear it in funk music, uh, you know, is, is in addition to jazz and what have you. So um, I hear I hear jazz in everything. Um, and, uh, you know, like what was said earlier, uh, you know, without 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 monk, there is no funk um, in a lot of ways. Uh, unless I hear that monk in that funk, uh, regardless <laughs> of the type of music it is, uh, it's not hip. So uh, it's got to have that jazz, that monk, that funk element in the music, regardless of the genre. So I hear jazz in all of it. Great, thank you. All right, and Tyler had a question, another question. Okay, so my question is from 11 year old Tyler Brown of Moran Middle School in Wallingford. Mm -hmm. He asks, I am studying both drums and guitar and had the privilege of meeting T.S. Monk last year. He gave me some great advice for learning my instrument. My question now is, what can I do to get more opportunities to play with other musicians? I'm, I'm mostly a rock drummer, but I would like to learn how to play jazz. Well, you know, uh, <clears throat> as Wayne can attest, uh, because he's another musician, uh, the first thing you have to do to, to learn to play jazz is you gotta listen. You gotta listen to, just listen you know, and it's the hardest thing to do sometimes when you're listening and your goal is to pursue, but you really have to listen. And I would tell him, you know, uh, as a drummer, you know, and as a guitarist, I don't know which, which instrument he will ultimately end up on, but for both instruments, listen to the greats. You listen to the greats and then don't be afraid to try and imitate, you know, uh, but I've always believed that if you can't hear it, you can't play it, you know? And so you have to like listen. Uh, and it's like anything else. I mean, you know, if you don't know how to play basketball, uh, the first thing you need to do is go out and watch some basketball players and see what, how do you dribble the ball? You know, what is a jump shot? all those kinds of things. So I would say, you know, jazz is a vintage endeavor. And what I mean by that is that uh, it takes time. It's like, it's like a fine wine and you just stick with it and you get better and you get better and better at it, you know? But in the beginning, the first thing you do, the first thing that inspired me was listening. I'm sure the first thing that inspired Kyle was listening to a drummer. And he said, boy, I think I can do that. And so he picked up the drums and then he listened to a guitarist and said, boy, I can do that. And so, you know, for jazz, you just do the same thing. You know, instead of listening to Jimi Hendrix, you listen to Wes Montgomery, you, you listen to George Benson or Charlie Bird or someone like that, you know? And once you can hear it, you'll know how to get into it. Yeah, and can and can I just echo what what T S is saying? I mean, listening and and ingesting the music 
um, from that point of view first is so important. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm 45 years old now and, and, and I can't believe it, but I am. And uh, even, even now I'm still, when I practice really just trying to get out what's in my head and what's in my ear, it's already in here. You know, it's and I'm just trying to get it out of my instrument. So if you have you just taken all that you can so that you have the information and just spend the time trying to get it out and try to relay it in a certain kind of way. That's the idea. Um, the other the other part of that question about like trying to, um, you know, get a chance to play with other people and stuff. I mean, even now, like I, I was just mentioning earlier, even now, I mean, I don't have to. But even now, I heard some people were playing down the street at the park. I said, you know what, let me go down there because I want to be around people. I want to take I want to take in what they have. You know, I want to take in what they have. I want them to throw something at me and I want to try to react to it and see what I do. I mean, this music is a, is a communal music. It's not it's not even though we're in this strange time now, it's really not just one person in front of a computer screen doing a thing. You got, I mean, anybody, one musician told me anybody can shadow box, right? You got to get, you, you got to get in the ring and you got to get hit and be like, oh, okay, well now let me see what I got to do. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. So those two things are really important. You got to seek out those musicians, go at them, go at them in a, in a very humble kind of way and be like, hey man, can I play? I just want to try to, you know, get in here, you know? So true. I love that. Kyle had another question. He had a, a personal question. Yeah, so this is uh, more for the panel as a whole. Um, we know that music reflects the social climate in which it's created. Um, with the protests surrounding the Black Lives Matter movement and the fact that we are in the middle of a global pandemic, um, what innovations have you seen artists making today? Oh girl, you better get into that. That's right in your wheelhouse. <laughs> who, who, me? <laughs> well, I, I gotta, yeah. I gotta tell yeah. you from from my from my point of view, I've had to really thrust myself into this whole technology thing, which I was fighting with all my might. <laughs> but um, you know, we we have to uh, we have to figure out a way to make music and and share with people. So I think the biggest the biggest uh, uh, you know technological thing we, we've 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 gotten from this is really just just um just managing technology and finding a way to reach out uh, to each other despite this and and i think ts you you mentioned this earlier i mean one one thing that's happening due to this this um this pandemic is we're actually communicating more we're talking more to each other we're doing things like we are right now you know i'm getting to meet these these my esteemed uh, colleagues here and 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 it's it's a beautiful thing and and because of this we're able to reflect on things like um, what's happening with the Black Lives Matter movement? We're, you know, we're seeing footage um, on television and, and, and on and on social media that maybe we would have um, not necessarily paid that close of attention to because we were so busy. Um, and I think it's 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 affecting everybody. It's 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 affecting everybody, and it's and it's a hard thing, but I think it's a good thing. And we're all getting we're all being enriched uh, because of everything that's happening. And when you're enriched in that way, it goes into the music as you said, because the music uh, really mirrors society. So it's, it's, it's full circle. It's a hard circle sometimes, but it's full circle. Okay, and Kaden, did you get the, the uh, question that someone just sent? Okay. <laughs> okay, this, can I just, oh, I'm so um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, you can go. No, 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 I was just, I'm sorry, Kaden. I'll just say, um, Again, me being kind of unruly. I'm thinking about uh, a, the protests after the election. I live in DC and or in the DC area, and I'm thinking about people standing around the White House singing um, <clears throat> "WAP" by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion. And I'm thinking about a song that was not a protest song by any means, um, but thinking about how people use popular music to make a statement. Um, and so that's one thing that uh, stands out to me about music and the Black Lives Matter protest. Songs that don't carry on their face like any kind of political message um, or any kind of like revolutionary protest message, I'll say something that I can, you know, that you might consider like we shall overcome, right? It's not that kind of a song. Y'all know the song, you know? And so to think about people standing around chanting that um, says something about even now, like music's way of 
not only bringing people together, but people's ways, very, people's creative ways of using music to make a to make a good noise. Nice. And we have one more question um, that is actually for the students, apparently. Um, and this question is from Patrick Smith from uh, Co-op High School in New Haven. Uh, it says, music from the days of Thelonious Monk had a huge impact on the youth of those times. How is the music of today impacting your lives? The students did not anticipate a question geared to, toward them. So <laughs> any of you can answer or any of the panelists. Uh, yeah. I could oh, answer. Sorry, go ahead. Oh. Okay. Um, well, like um, I kind of said in the beginning, I'm a dancer and I like to use musicality to, it helps me, it inspires me to make a lot of my dances. So when new music is coming out and there's something that I would think I would like to dance to, I would always give it a listen, but it also determines on what they're talking about in the song and like the beat and everything. It usually has to flow for me. So. Yeah, so um, I think that it's a lot easier to create and share music now with a, with a broader audience. I mean, with social media, it's, um, it's a lot easier to promote your own Stuff and so when you have all those different influences to to take from, I think it's um there's kind of a chain reaction where like more people want to become musicians and get involved with music, and so I I think that it's just really a a blessing to see all that's being shared and put out there. Like there's just so many ideas, and I I'm just I'm just grateful for it all really. Um, coming from me, um, I'm more of like a visual artist. So it's like really interesting to see like how those things tap into each other. So, um, sometimes just like, I'm more of like a video editor and stuff like that. Um, I listen to like a song sometimes and that like would actually inspire me on like a film project that I want to do, or just um, some type of visual story that I'm trying to tell. Um, and I see that through music. Music is just storytelling in another, um, landscape. Um, I see that through you know, the music that I listen to today. Um, even though I will say the only thing that we're losing right now is that social aspect that music um, definitely gets to tap into. Um, we're definitely losing that um, in a pandemic world, which we kind of talked about upon, but um, it's communication and we're never gonna lose that. So that's what's really important about music and how it helps my artwork, I will say. Um, so I feel like music is beginning to evolve more with the times and just becoming more evolutionary with what people are accustomed to. So like rap is the thing nowadays and there will be a time when something else, when another genre is more prevalent and people are more attached to that. And I'd ask the same, I guess the same question, it'd be a little different if we ask the panelists, but um, feel free to, to answer to that. Well, you know, I, 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 I like, you know, I have the worst musical taste in the world because I like everybody's stuff. I like the old stuff. I like the new stuff. I like the stuff I used to do. I like the stuff I'm doing today. Uh, I like the hip hop stuff. I mean, you know, I, I think if you love music, if you really love music, well, you know, as a jazz musician, you have to listen to everything. You really do have to listen to everything, you know? I mean, wouldn't you agree with that, Wayne? For sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah, you gotta you gotta hear it all, you know. So I don't have any limitations, you know, and and by the way, <clears throat> you know, in the monk household, people would, would think all we listened to was Thelonious Monk. <laughs> but it ain't true. 
Because <laughs> Monk was like every other great jazz musician. He was listening to all kinds of stuff. In fact, he had a little penchant for opera, you know, and people don't associate the Lonnie Smoke with opera, but he dug opera. But, you know, I never had any limitations. You know, it was, it was you know, I grew up when AM radio, you know, you had a, a rotation, a stupid rotation that went around all day. And I'd have the radio on playing all this crazy stuff. And Thelonious was just taking it in. In fact, there was a there's a great musician uh, who, who is a jazz and classical composer uh, and conductor. His name is David Amram. And David said when he first met Thelonious, right, right he knocked on the door, you know, because Thelonious told him to come by. And when Thelonious opened the door, he ran to the back of the house and said, come here, come here, come here, come here, man. And he said, do you hear, do you dig what's going on? And it was a bluegrass guitarist, <laughs> you know? And Thelonious was taking it in because everybody's got something to say. See, that goes right on back to the basic principle of jazz. Everybody's got something to say, which is the basis of this country that we're in. Everybody's got mm -hmm. something to say. That's, That's right. Mm -hmm. there, there's a really great story, great quote where um, a journalist is a asking Thelonious, so Thelonious, what kind of music do you like? He says, I like all kinds of music. And then he says, do you like country? And he turned to, he turned to Bill, Ben Riley and says, is he deaf? <laughs> 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 it's like, I said I like all kinds of music. I can see deaf. Right. It's like, just dropped it right there. It tells, it tells you everything. You would always, what always, uh, interests me is is young people's reaction to music. And when I say young people, I guess I'm I guess I'm thinking about maybe maybe teenagers, you know, those of the in, in the early teens to, to to early 20s, just their reaction to music and what moves them and why. And it's not and it's not that I want to make my music, you know, more popular music so that kids that 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 young that the younger people you know, understand it, but it does intrigue me as to well, what is it about this music and a certain music in particular that that they enjoy? Is it um, is it the, the the harmonic structure with that it's that it's simpler? Is it the type of instruments? Is it the beat? And I want to, in some way, incorporate some of those elements in in what I do, not in trying to do in, into trying to uh, you know copy any other kind of music, but um, it, it it definitely intrigues me to try to to try to incorporate some of those elements that 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 younger people enjoy into my music but in us but still within within keeping in the complexities of what i love about jazz you know um and that that amuses me a lot so i love talking to young people about it and just listening to their to their music so i can so i can get that uh, oh nicole i'm sorry go ahead <laughs> the question what the question say the question again maketa <laughs> Hold on, let me get back to my email um, but while I'm doing that. Okay, here it goes. Um, so music from the days of Thelonious Monk had a huge impact on the youth of those times. How is the music of today impacting your life? Yeah, um, I think like, like everyone has said, I think it becomes part of how, we, how I learned to connect and communicate. Um, I'm here on this panel because of music, not only because of Monk's original brilliance, but also because another Monk, Marcella Monk Flake, was my choir director. Um, and so I'm sure, uh, you know, we talked earlier about what it about what it means to be an individual, but also to to be part of a, an ensemble. Um, and so I I'm holding on to that. You know, and and so in many ways, like that's how music of today continues um, to shape me. Not only the music that I listen to, um, but my own individual relationship to music um, that evolves and is pushing me forward too. I love that. Well, we want to thank the student participants. Um, I just want to say that Isaiah Troy and Caden Wooten are both 
monk descendants. Um, and so <laughs> we thank you guys for being on and you as well, Tyler and Kyle, we love you. Um, thank you for your amazing questions and for our guests as well. Thank you for your questions. Our panelists, thank you for your beautiful answers. Um, and we're going to see the students later and we're going to have Marcella Flake come on back. <laughs> And I should probably make sure I say Marcella Monk Flake. She, she, thank you. <laughs> Very proud of her name. We all are. <laughs> So I guess I'll ask one more question while we wait. Um, I think there was a question about Thelonious being on the Tonight Show. That was yeah, I, I saw that. I saw that. Yes, um, uh, June tenth, nineteen fifty five. He was on the Tonight Show when it was hosted by Steve Allen, mm. and um, it's a very interesting story. You know what what happened on that show, uh, and. Um, I mean, I could say more about it, but I guess I'm waiting for Marcella to, to no, jump in. No, please, please talk about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Um, so it was it was a really big deal, and Steve Allen, as many some may know, was was himself a piano player, uh, and he, there were moments when he wasn't as respectful, but he was sort of being jokey when he said to, to Thelonious, "Well, like, do you read? Like, do you read music?" And you know. Thelonious was kind of taken back by the questions. Of course I read music. And then, you know, when they went to play, I mean, they they killed it. They played off minor. And and Thelonious explained where they're going, going to go with the music. Um, and so it was it was one of these moments where, you know, the, the hope was this performance on the Tonight Show would boost Mung. And this is while he didn't have his cabaret card. Uh, but unfortunately... Uh, it didn't translate into like, you know, more exposure or record sales. And at the very end, he's backstage having a fight with the manager because he found out they're going to pay him scale. He says, what do you mean scale? So the whole experience was kind of a mixed thing. But, um, but it was important that Thelonious was represented and he played, his band played as it would play, as he would play anywhere, five spot or whatever. Um, so it was a, an adventure. And ultimately, uh, Steve Allen became uh, a great, particularly in the years before his death, became a great champion for the Monk yes. Institute. Yes, that is true. And, and and to be fair, I mean, when Steve Allen asked a question, he wasn't trying to be hostile. Um, he was trying. He was just doing his role. But he's someone who actually... He was responsible for Monk being on the show. I mean, Steve Allen loved Monk's music. He said he should be on the show. Uh, and and that was a very important break, you know, at the time. Marcella. Hi. Well, listen, thank you guys so much. I, I, I just came in, Robin, so I'm not sure if you finished your thought. I want to make sure you finished your thought. Did, are you? You're, you're good. You guys were phenomenal. I was trying to watch on my cell phone, but be ready to jump back in. This has been a, an awesome, awesome event. And I can't thank you guys enough for coming in and agreeing to do this. To the young people, you were phenomenal. And I just want to um, acknowledge two of our monk descendants among the young people, Isaiah, um, who spoke about being a graphic artist. That's my brother's grandson. And Caden Wooten is my Aunt Pauline Monk's great granddaughter. So we try to keep the children, we want our young people, not only in the community, but our own biologically related um, monks to know this history, to cherish this history, to know that 
you know, there's greatness. Um, there's greatness in every child. And I, I just can't thank you guys enough. I don't want to, you know, belabor the point, but I, I labor the point, not belabor, but <laughs> labor the point. Nicole, don't laugh at me. Um, but I just so appreciate each and every one of you and everyone who has um, joined us tonight. Thank you so much, Bonnie Johnson. Thank you. Every member of the Monk Youth Jazz and Steam Collective, every committee member, um, those of you who had the pre-med, who had the law, who had the pre-engineering, you know, we're looking for volunteers. We know there's a wealth of knowledge and wealth of expertise. And we encourage you to please visit our website. It's www.monkyouthjazz.org. Mm -hmm. So www.monkyouthjazz.org. We're looking, we're going to start our Saturday Academy, the first Saturday in February. And we'll have curricular modules that include multiculturalism and the law, um, pre-engineering, dance, music, um, finance, architecture and design. We want our young people prepared to walk into any, any, any area um, without fear or trembling, as my parents would say. So just thank you again. I can't thank you guys enough. And let's do this again real soon. Okay. Um, I'd like to give you each an opportunity to have part, parting words. And we'll start with Dr. Nicole because uh, <laughs> we brought you in first. And so we're going to allow you to have first parting words. By the way, I have to say, that's my baby. He's my baby. She'll always be my baby. Uh -huh. Dr. Nicole. <laughs> and I'm not laughing at you. So stop that. This was an honor. Thank you all so much. I, I always promised to keep remarks uh, short when I was a kid. So I'm gonna stick to that. Thank Robin. you all. Yeah, I just wanna thank you for putting this together. It's just so great to be with all of you. Uh, and I especially wanna acknowledge the important work you're doing with the young people. Those, those kids, I mean, I was in tears watching that video at the beginning and you know, having a, a, a nine-year-old myself who just is doing really well on violin and just loves life. I felt like those kids are like my kids. So thank you for everything. And, and thanks everyone on this panel for all your wise words. Thank you. Wayne? Uh, well, of course, thanks so much for having me, Marcel. Thanks for putting this together. And and, and again, I was really moved by by um, by the eloquence of those kids and, and their talent. Um, and it was really great to have them here. And I must say, it's, it's really an honor to be um, particularly here with uh, with uh, T.S. I've always, uh, you know, ad, ad, you know, admired him, and he's, and he, you know, he he helped mentor me back in the day, and and of course, uh, you know, helped me get my master's at the Thelonious Monk Institute. So that's a it's a big deal being here, uh, you know, in the capacity of as a colleague, so to speak, and and also Ro Rob and Kelly, you know, your your book was uh, when that came out, everyone was talking about it, it was a must read in the jazz community, and I I sat on many plane rides getting through it. You know, some of it was thick. I was like. I gotta get through this part. I gotta figure out what's happening here, and it really, it really gave me a lot of great knowledge. So it's, it's really an honor to be here with every, every, with everybody. So thank you. And before we close with my cousin T.S., um, I just want to say to him publicly: you have the most beautiful heart, the most beautiful heart, and I, huh, I, I think of you, and I think of how you love how you love people, how you love young people in particular. And, you know, starting in, boy, almost 10 years ago, uh, you and Gail, I asked if you'd come to New Haven and if you'd bring your band. And not only did you come and bring your band, but you came for an entire weekend. You held master classes for kids. You held workshops for young people. You held interdistrict assembly programs, you came, you drove back and forth from New Haven to New Jersey and back and forth and back and forth. And I, I can't thank you enough, cuz. Um, we have so much work to do. Our babies need so much, they deserve so much. And I really, I just wanna thank you publicly, you and the Thelonious Monk Estate. And Gail is an unsung hero. I thank God for her. And, you know, I, I just, 
I just feel so blessed to be a monk and to be your cousin. And uh, just had to get that out of a cry, baby. I can't help it. But I just so appreciate you. Thank you so much. You and know, you um, have final words. I uh, we formed the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz in 1987, and I was the chair for 28 years, and it was the pride of my life, you know, more so than, you know, the hit records and the success as a, as a band leader and all that. But I want to thank you because what you've done is you have taken Thelonious's legacy uh, and the impact of his legacy to the next level with the Monk Youth and Jazz and Steam Collective. And the idea of Thelonious's legacy going beyond and, 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 and his ideologies going beyond just the music is a tremendous gift that I know he is smiling on you for doing this. And so I want to thank you, you know, and I just feel, I mean, this has been, this has been fantastic. This has been fantastic. And the collective is going to live. I know the collective is going to live because you're at the head and you're a real go-getter. And there are so many wonderful people involved in this program to get it off the ground, uh, including your beautiful daughter there. Uh, she's, you know, she and, and Dudley, you know, and Gary and Pam and all of you have done such a great job. Uh, so you don't have to thank me. You know, I got given drums by Art Blakey. I just, my father just, daddy just told me to go on over to Max Roach's house for him to teach you, you know? So my feeling has always been, I owe, I owe, I owe. And that's been the impetus behind the monk, my involvement with the Monk Institute. And that's the emphasis behind my involvement with the Monk Youth Jazz and Steam Collective, because I owe. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to pay back a little more. You know, I, uh, I'll be 71 this month. And so, uh, tell you the truth, I don't know how much time I got left, but this is so- A long time, long, long time. Long time, long time. This is a worthy endeavor. This is a worthy endeavor for me, you know, on, the downside of the mountain. God bless you, my dear. God bless all of your students. And God bless everyone that's involved uh, in this program. And everybody, be safe, wear a mask, and we're all going to get through this. And then we're going to really, boy, we're going to pop. Yes, we are. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> thank you so much. So I just want to end by saying thank you to everyone who uh, joined us tonight. This program was funded by the Connecticut Humanities and um, underwritten by the Thelonious Monk Estate. Uh, we had sponsorship by Yale University Undergraduate Steam Collective and uh, Stetson Library from New Haven. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank my siblings. I know they're here. They are, you know, they're kind of behind the scenes and always rooting for me. I'm number seven of nine children. Uh, monks didn't play. <laughs> and uh, and my husband, Dudley. Thank you so much, Dudley. My children, Maketa, Duran, Sheba, Alicia, Sahara. We have quite a few. And just everyone, the New Haven community. But lastly, I'd like to dedicate this to my beautiful, beautiful parents, Conley and Olivia Monk who loved us, who nurtured us, who put a fire in our hearts for community service. And uh, there's, it's a monk thing to love your community. So God bless you all. Thank you again. And we'll see you soon. God bless.
in the broadcast, Dudley? It says in broadcast. Did you already end it?